welcome Irene. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this time and welcome to my space. And uh, this has been such a long journey for you. I think since 1995, uh, when you did, if correct me if I'm wrong, when you did your first project in, as an independent editor, Mouthful of Sky. I mean, before that, I did smaller projects, but yeah, that must be the first like major thing that I did it independently. Yeah. yeah. And but your uh, passion for maybe storytelling and uh, some affinity with cinema started even before that. I remember interviewing you and you told me it all began with Prem Pujari and Devanand. And uh, <laughs> so just take me back to, you know, the formative years uh, and your uh, life in Bhutan and in Kolkata, those years, wonder years, and how uh, cinema became a part of your life. I know a little bit of that story, but it would be great to hear it again. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on your show. Um, I hope like I can make some sense to you, like what, to what I say. Um, yeah. So I grew up in Bhutan and I mean, I went to Bhutan when I was three months old. My parents uh, took up jobs there. So, and uh, most of the time we were in places where there were no cinema halls. So, uh, probably one of the first films I watched was when I was on holiday uh, at my maternal grandparents in Odisha. And the film was probably in Pujari. And uh, yeah, it was. It was great fun, you know. I used to really look forward to, I mean, once, I don't re remember how many films I watched initially, but I got hooked to watching films. Whenever, if anybody wanted to take me to watch a film, I would be very excited. Um, most of the time, it was, it was a mama, my mother's brother, who was very film crazy. So during holidays, he would often take me to watch films. And these were like, of course, regular mainstream Bollywood films. He was like, he was a big fan of Quran for instance. So, you know, those kind of films. But I, I loved watching all, anything. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, later in Bhutan, when they were in Thimphu, which is the capital, I mean, even there, there were just two cinema halls. But I think uh, we used to probably watch almost any Hindi film that showed there, especially because my mother was very crazy in films. So, and uh, me and I have two brothers. One of my brothers, Anya, also became very <laughs> obsessed with films. Two of us used to really love watching films with more. Yeah, I, you, you told me also this memory of, you know, watching your father cry uh, after he was, he, he was watching a uh, Ritwik Ghatak film. And I think that kind of made you uh, more connected with the idea of powerful storytelling and you know something more than just entertainment. Uh, I remember you telling me about that. I think yeah, it was Mege, was Mege Dhaka Tara. If I Mege Dhaka Tara. Yeah, that was the screening during my college years. I think probably uh, Jadavpur University Film Club screening for which they were also selling tickets so I've taken my parents along. And, I mean, my father being a I mean, he, he grew up in East uh, Pakistan, so he had, he had left his home behind. So the story, see, my father is uh, not a film buff at all. He hates, not hates, but he's not very passionate about films. He used to watch films because we wanted to watch. I mean, he is slept through Mukaddar, you know, he's that kind of thing. But there was this film now, I mean, he was watching Mega Zakatara. I saw him in tears. So yeah, that's the power of storytelling because this was a story that he could identify with. The other thing I wanted to ask you is that uh, there was a certain emphasis on academics in your family and you did your master's, if I remember, uh, in literature. Did you do it in literature? Yes, I, I did my master's in English. Literature. And then you decided you're going to join FTI. And why did you choose editing? Uh, because it is an, kind of an unusual uh, choice. Uh, see, at the point when I uh, decided to become an editor, I probably was not uh, that aware of, you know, what exactly an editor did and what 
how different it was from what a director did. I mean, I had vague, I mean, obviously a cinematographer is a person who shot the film and a sound recordist is who's recorded, but I think like editing is not that clearly defined, right? But I had heard that editing is definitely one way to, a uh, very interesting way to get into filmmaking and you, you know, if you're an edit, films are made at the, on the edit table. So, oh, and also this was a shorter course. It was a two year course, the others were three year courses. I don't really spend so much of my life studying, like you know, I've completed my masters. So I think altogether I decided to go in for editing. I couldn't have a, a gone for uh, sound because I was not from a science background. Um, so it would probably be either direction or editing. And I must have read up some stuff and decided, okay, it's editing for me. But I didn't really, it was not that much of an informed choice. Right. You also said that, you know, those years in FGI were kind of very happy and trippy. And uh, could you just recall or share some memories of the kind of teachers who mentored you and the kind of cinema that you were exposed to over there? So, um, see, the greatest thing about FGI is probably um, it made one feel that, okay, you know, um, I can also be a part of filmmaking. I can make films. I can... Uh, see, outside the industry, there's a certain amount of um, glamour associated with the whole thing. And here, uh, you get into the film institute and you, know, you start watching films and you start learning how to make films. And the whole process becomes, you know, it's, it's something you understand, right? You begin to understand, you begin to understand films, you begin to appreciate good films. And you also learn how to do it properly maybe. Um, during the time I was an editing student and at FTI, we had, we were very lucky. We had a professor whom we used to call Rao Saab. A lot of editing students of my time and before me were, uh, you know, we'll have stories about him. We were probably the last batch to get him. We were lucky in that. And uh, yeah, I think he taught us well because he used to show us all kinds of films. He was always, you know, he was uh, what would seem initially, he would be very discouraging about our work. Whatever we did, he would say, eh. And then we gradually realized that, you know, he would do that eh because he wanted us to try to, you know, better what we were doing. And he was actually the happiest when we would do something well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he taught us really well about how to, he explained what an editor's contribution would be. It was not just to, you know, put two shots together, but to do it in the most uh, meaningful way. Right. Uh, you also spoke about the great uh, Renu Saluja. And um, uh, she was someone, as uh, we discussed the last time, she was somebody who kind of, <laughs> you know, made the, the term uh, female editor redundant because her body of work is so vast, you know, from Parinda to Jane Bhi Doyaro and so many more films. And you went on to assist her in three films, right? right? Purush, 1942, A Love Story, and uh, there was another one. Mujse Dosti Karo. Mujse Dosti Karo. Um, what are some of your memories of her? And because so many people have said so many things about her. You know, uh, what is the one thing that you remember that kind of uh, has stayed with you personally and professionally? The most wonderful thing about her was she was very down to earth. Renu was very down to earth, very approachable. She had a very hearty laugh. She used to love singing, especially at, while at work, you know, she'd be humming away by everything. She sang well. And she... Um, made you feel very welcome, made you feel a part of her team, you know, showed appreciation where it was due. And uh, she was also so clearly the boss, you know, like uh, she, like if she was editing a film, uh, I think the director always uh, took her contribution very seriously. I mean, her suggestions were, I mean, she, people listened to her and it was because she was, very good 
but apart from the fact that she was extremely good in her craft she was also a good leader she took care of her assistants she helped them grow she would push us to you know take on independent projects and then even like um, a mouthful of sky was in an organization where she was also a part of right so she would encourage us to be independent and if you ever told her like i i i didn't know how to edit on tape and i was very nervous about this and then he said you know how to edit now what is the big deal the same thing happened when the when edit uh, the editing started happening on computers you know when avid and all came she, she would just so she will say you can do it you know how to edit why are you afraid of technology you know so she was very uh, that was very encouraging i guess because she was she, she, there are people who are insecure right so they're not mm. so nice to their assistants mm. she never had any reason to be and she was a very warm and nice person right. her editing everybody knows like she was really good but yeah. she was also a very nice person and, Um, yeah and one thing i remember about her which was very nice was she she loved working okay she was like an absolute absolute worker her you know morning to night but if you did not want to work till night she would you know she would tell tell you i think you want to go now it's 6 now 6 pm now you want to go you can go it's not like uh, normally an assistant is allowed supposed to stay for as long as the you know, boss is around she was not like that when just because she was obsessed to both work loved her work she didn't expect the other person to be like that right right uh when you started uh, as an independent editor in 95 how was the environment then for a woman editor i mean it's a term i hate but uh, in this context i have to use it and have things changed since then are more women entering into editing do you see more numbers uh in terms of you know equal representation in editing rooms so it's not as good as it can be see around the time i came actually gradually there were more of the editors and uh, at the moment i think there are a lot of women editors and uh, women editors are doing very well so if you look at uh, films ott platform shows you'll notice that there are a lot of women editors and they're doing very well most of them are trained at say fti srft or say whistling mills trained editors it's uh, there's no longer a, i don't think uh, your gender matters when you're chosen for a job at all which i'm very glad to see i it may still matter for the other uh, you know like if you're a cinematographer do it's even that's changing but for an editor i don't think it matters if you are a woman editor or a male editor i think it's your work that matters it was not the case earlier because there were too few and uh, when i joined for instance there were times when you felt uncomfortable in certain work environments which is not there anymore right and since then of course you've done films you've done shows uh, your you know documentaries you've done and the kind of uh, the list of credits kind of goes on and on and you won a national award as well for uh, celluloid man um is what kind of work is coming your way now and what kind of work would you like to do which hasn't really happened as of now and if there are any plans of directing at some point see uh, when i was younger i used to think that i'm going to direct at some point but uh, i think uh, i'm happy editing i it's something i probably am not going to do in life i used to think i would but i'm very happy editing so i don't think i'm going to change that i may um, try to write again i have written earlier i might write a little more but uh, as for the kind of films that i'm getting the kind of editing work i'm getting right now i'm in a very happy space uh, because uh, see i i have edited a lot of documentaries i love editing documentaries but uh, editing documentaries can be very draining 
because uh, each time you do a new project, see there are several uh, hours of footage, often like more than a hundred. And to be able to edit a documentary well, you need to know all that footage. You need to watch it multiple times. So, you know, it's a lot of, lot to take in to process and then to come out with a, to do justice to all the footage to tell the story, right? So, um, yeah, I have, I love doing it, but it's also draining. So after like doing a couple of documentaries, I like it when I get to do a fiction, you know, it's like a change. It's here is something for which I have a script. I'm going to follow the script and then take it from there. So I, I've been fortunate that right now I've like, you know, I just finished two documentaries and then I got one fiction, uh, a feature, fiction feature film to edit. And then as soon as that got over, I started editing another fiction, you know, feature. So yeah, that just the perfect balance. Is, is there any, um any instinct or any kind of a conscious uh, you know choice that goes into you making a decision about whether to take up a project or not because there is a certain sensibility in the kind of work that you choose to do uh, whether it's the your documentaries whether it's uh, cinema i mean it it's not all, always just entertainment there is more to it there's some substance to the work that you do in terms of themes, is it a conscious choice or is it just something that has happened along the way? So it has happened also because the um, a certain kind of uh, people will reach out to me, right? So if they're making a documentary about something which they think that you know they would like to have me on board, then they contact me. So yeah, so it's probably because they've seen my work and they know that I would be able to do just it. Uh, justice to a film like this that's why they reach out to me so it's been a certain kind of work and there have been a few times when I have known that I won't be able to do this project properly so I say no or sometimes people talk to me and realize that it's the wrong mm -hmm. choice and they back out so yeah both mm -hmm. things happen yeah uh, I was also um just going to ask you about Onir because his book is coming out now and you have edited most of his films. Uh, what has it been like to share a creative space with him and how do you look back at his journey, which has been oftentimes quite challenging in, in the industry? I am, of course, very proud of what he's achieved. But I'm also, I get uh, concerned about stuff that he has to go through. So it's a, sometimes, you know, it gets more personal than professional. But I'm always a part of his projects and his whatever bouncing board. And he knows like, I'm always there. And to a certain extent, I'm like kind of a little taken for granted too. Like, like I'm probably the last, last person of the crew to be to come on board each time, you know, because like I'm there. So, mm. you know, like sometimes I tell him, so I ask him, am I editing the film? You haven't asked me yet, you know? And then he'll say, oh, if you have the time. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but uh, I'm kind of always a part of his films, apart from the, the first one. The first one I was, uh, my daughter was too young, plus I was not here. I was in Pune. I had done a brief teaching stint at FDI, so I was in Pune at that point. So I hadn't edited this first one. The rest I have. I have co written the book with him. Oh, okay. is it? I didn't know. Yeah. That. Okay. Yeah. Give me a little glimpse, not to give too much away, but what is it about exactly? It's, it's his life. So, yeah, he's talked about his childhood about uh, his films, about how he came to Bombay, started working and, uh, you know, how his goal was always to try to make a film and how he got there. And he also talks about him realizing he's gay and the journey towards acceptance, the, you know, being able to talk about it and 
also, I guess gradually going to a place where first you talk about it, right? Then you realize that I not only want acceptance, it's my right, right? I need to be accepted, right? So. Um, you had once uh, said that, you know, cinema is about engaging with the audience and not so much about creating, you know, multi crore spectacles and uh, with half-baked scripts. Uh, what do you think of the kind of cinema that is coming out now? Do you have any strong opinions or you're just neutral and you throw your hands up, up in the air and move on? But I kept, I kept trying to once in a while to, you know, like watch these films that uh, come out and do very well. And the last time I tried to watch one, and I'm not going to take the name, but it's a recent re release which did really well. I just, for the life of me, couldn't figure out why it's doing so well. And I mean, it's not even, I mean, it's fun, fine if it's a fun film, right? A fun film can also be written properly, you know, directed properly. There's nothing wrong with a fun film. It can be total no-brainer, but do it right. I mean, but I mean, it's a hit, so it's a hit. Right. But well, yeah, each time I watch one, then I, <laughs> I kind of, Get uh, puts me off for a few months at least. Why do you think that is happening? Um, because for some of us uh, who grew up in uh, the 70s, you know, and the 80s, uh, the cinema, even when it was entertaining, had a certain sensibility. I mean, like you said, it, it was done right, uh, even, if, even if it was a no-brainer. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now why is it that We've kind of lost the plot, so to speak. We don't know uh, what we are creating and why it's all, it's just a confusing trip that filmmakers are on and they take their audience, audiences on. And sometimes things click, sometimes they don't. Uh, why do you think, have our tastes devolved? What has happened? Why do you think this is happening? I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's not like, each awful film that gets made is a hit, right? There are a lot of them that also sink. Mm. Some very huge budget films. All these films are made with the intention of becoming hits. And people, if it's supposed to be a brainless film, they make it as brainless as they can, try to put in as many gags as they can and you know, all kinds of things, glass eyes and everything. But uh, some of them, become hits and some of them don't. Uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's it's not just the audience to blame, I'm sure. I, I, they're not, how do we wo work out a proper balance between, you know, entertainment and storytelling? If one can, maybe the audience will wrap it up. But I do believe that I mean, films can be entertaining and well made. I hope that transition happens someday. But right now we are seeing a lot of mindless stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's from the South or, you know, the, the South films that are dubbed and do very well. I recently watched one of them and that was as mindless as our you know, Bollywood produce. So, yeah. Um, when I, I remember that when you kind of uh, returned your national award. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but it was something like an act of dissent. Uh, do you mm -hmm. think as a citizen of this country and as an artist and a creative uh, mind and editor, do you have any hope that this country is going to reclaim its democratic soul? Um, is that going to happen anytime soon? Do you see any hope in that? Well, I'll, I'll always hope that happens. I mean, no matter how the small things look, I'll always hope that happens. You do have hope? Yeah, I do. And what do you want to say to young people? Because um, the kind of environment that you learned 
filmmaking and editing in a place like FTI, for, for, for instance. Now, even the institutions are changing or are they, they are being changed. What would you say to some young person who wants to enter the arts and has limited access to the kind of freedom that you had when you were learning your craft? See, I think it's the only thing that has changed as far as the film institutes goes probably that the film education has become much more expensive than it was in my time. I don't think I would have been able to afford it right now from the kind of background that I came from. It's become much more expensive. Apart from that, I mean, though there are policy changes and stuff, students have it in them to fight it out and, you know, get the education they want. Of course, there are students who are just very complacent and they you know, don't care enough, but I think there are enough students who make the most out of their uh, time at the film institutes. And because you are there for, a, for anybody who gets into one of the film institutes, it's like your dream come true. You want to, you want a certain kind of education, you want to watch films, you want to prepare for a life ahead. And I think you manage to do it. And if something gets in your way, you fight that. Right. I just want to tell you how much I admire you. Because I, I think the way you live your life and the way you quietly go on doing your work and yet such exemplary work, such a beautiful life. You are such an inspiration and I just have nothing but great respect and love for you. Thank you so much for coming here or rather giving Thank this you. time and, Thank you. and being yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi, this is Reema. And if you liked what you just saw, then... Um, do like and subscribe because remember this is a safe space for people to talk, share their stories, to hear each other and basically make some time in their busy lives for unboxed conversation.